This podcast is a member of the, the Association, Association of Poetry, Poetry Podcasting at poetrypodcasting.org. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another show of The Right Stuff. And uh, today's episode is the Halloween Special 2007. Uh, this show is only going to have poems in it. It's not going to have any uh, promos or music or any of that. Just poems and um they're not all my poems um only two of my poems the rest of the poems i got over at the um pddoc.com that's the public domain uh website and uh, they have a lot of not just poems but stories over there so uh check them out at www.pddoc.com and uh, now to start off this uh, poetry reading, and uh, I'm just, you know, just going to be reading the poems like I would at a poetry reading. I usually um, pre-record everything and put them together and um, make a playlist and put the playlist together and just all that. But this, uh, I figured I'd do it live to the hard drive. And uh, so this next poem... Um, I've been wanting to, uh, read it for quite a while. So I took, um, about a month of, uh, practicing reading this poem. And, uh, this poem is The Raven by Edgar Allan Poe. And it can be a very difficult poem. And, um, many people read it differently. Um, some people read it like, um, a fast read. And I don't think the poem should be read that way. I mean, that's my interpretation of uh, the poem. Um, you know, because it's like, um, you know, it starts off with his sadness, and then it gets off to, um, you know, he's, he's kind of um, pissed off. And you don't know if he's pissed off at, you know, this raven coming in, or if this raven is really from his mind, and he's pissed off that, you know, um, he keeps seeing this, in, you know, um, in his imagination. And uh, he's probably trying to come to grips with it. So that's my interpretation of the poem. Anyways, I mean, everybody has their own interpretations to various poems. So I hope you like this interpretation. Um, and, and they all, they also have um, on the PDDOC every poem or story – the authors, um, they have their birth and death, and uh, apparently he only was uh, um, in his 40s, you know, early 40s when he died, you know, because it's uh, January 19th, 1809 to October 7th, 1849. So I thought that was interesting. <clears throat> so uh, here is the poem, The Raven by Edgar Allan Poe. Once upon a midnight dreary, while I pondered, weak and weary, over many quaint and curious volumes of forgotten lore, while I nodded, nearly napping, suddenly there came a tapping, as of someone gently rapping, rapping at my chamber door. "'Tis some visitor,' I muttered, tapping at my chamber door, only this and nothing more. Ah! Distinctly, I remember it was in the bleak of December, and each separate dying ember wrought its ghost upon the floor. Eagerly I wished the morrow, vainly I had sought to borrow, from my book's surcease of sorrow, sorrow for the lost Lenore, for the rare and radiant maiden whom the angels name Lenore, nameless here forevermore. And the silken, sad, uncertain rustling of each purple curtain thrilled me, filled me with fantastic terrors never felt before, so that now, to still the beating of my heart, I stood repeating, "'Tis some visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door, some late visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door. This it is, and nothing more." Presently my soul grew stronger, hesitating no longer. Sir, said I, or madam, truly your forgiveness I implore. 
But the fact is, I was napping, and so gently you came rapping, and so faintly you came tapping, tapping at my chamber door, that I scarce was sure I heard you. Here I opened wide the door. Darkness there, and nothing more. Deep into that darkness peering, long I stood there wondering, fearing, doubting, dreaming dreams no mortals have ever dared dream before. But the silence was unbroken, and the stillness gave no token, and the only word there spoken was the whispered word, Lenore. This I whispered, and an echo murmured back the word, Lenore. Merely this, and nothing more. Back into the chamber turning, all my soul within me burning, soon again I heard a tapping, somewhat louder than before. Surely, said I, surely that is something at my window lattice. Let me see, then, what threat is, and this mystery explore. Let my heart be still a moment, and this mystery explore. Tis the wind, and nothing more. Open here I flung the shutter, when with many a flirt and flutter, in there stepped a stately raven of saintly days of yore. Not the least obsessance made he, not a minute stopped or stayed he, but with mine of lord or lady, perched above my chamber door, perched above a bust of palace just above my chamber door, perched and sat, and nothing more. Then this ebony bird beguiling my sad fancy into smiling, but the grave and stern decorum of the countenance it wore, though thy crest be shorn and shaven, though, I said, art sure no craven, ghastly grim and ancient raven, wandering from the nightly shore, tell me what thy lordly name is on the night's platoonian shore. Quoth the raven, Nevermore. Much I marveled this ungainly fowl to hear discourse so plainly, though its answer little meaning, little reverence bore. For we cannot help agreeing that no living human being ever yet was blessed with seeing bird above his chamber door, bird or beast above the sculptured bust above his chamber door, with such a name as Nevermore. But the raven, sitting lonely on the placid bus, spoke only that one word, as if his soul in that one word he did outpour. Nothing further than he uttered, not a feather than he fluttered, till I scarcely more than muttered, other friends have flown before. On the morrow he will leave me, as my hopes have flown before. Then the bird said, Nevermore. Startled at the stillness broken, but reply so aptly spoken, doubtless, said I, when it utters, what it utters is its only stock and store, caught from some unhappy master, whom a merciful disaster, followed fast and followed faster, till his songs one burden bore, till the dirges of his hope that melancholy burden bore, of never, never more. But the raven, still beguiling all my fancy into smiling, straight I wheeled a cushioned seat in front of bird and bust and door. Then upon the velvet sinking, I betook myself to linking, fancy unto fancy, thinking this ominous, what this ominous bird of yore, what this grim, ungainly, ghastly, gaunt, and ominous bird of yore, meant in croaking nevermore. This I sat engaged in guessing, but no syllable expressing to the fowl whose fiery eyes now burned into my bosom's core. This and more I sat divining, with my head at ease reclining, on the cushion's velvet lining that lamplight gloated over, but whose velvet violet lining with the lamplight gloated over, she shall pass, ah, nevermore. 
Then methought the air grew denser, perfumed from an unseen censer, swung by seraphim whose footfalls tinkled on the tufted floor. Wretch, I cried, thy God hath lent thee, by these angels he hath sent thee, respite, respite, and the pith from the memories of Lenore. Quoth, oh, quoth, this kind of pith, and forgot this lost Lenore. Quoth the raven, nevermore. Prophet, said I, thing of evil, prophet still, if bird or devil, whether tempter set, or whether temptest toss thee here ashore, desolate yet all undaunted, on this desert land enchanted, on this home by horror haunted, tell me truly, I implore, is there, is there balm in Gilad? Tell me, tell me, I implore. Quoth the raven, nevermore. Prophet, said I, thing of evil, prophet still, if bird or devil, by that heaven that bends above us, by that God we both adore, tell this soul with sorrow laden, if within the distant Aden, if it shall clasp a saintly, a sainted maiden, whom the angels name Lenore, clasp a rare and radiant maiden, whom the angels name Lenore. Quoth the raven, nevermore. Be that word our sign and parting, bird or fiend, I shrieked upstarting, get thee back into the tempest and the night's platoonian shore. Leave no black plume as, leave no black plume as a token of that lie that soul hath spoken. Leave my loneliness, loneliness unbroken, quit the above a bust my door. Take thy beak from out my heart, and take thy form from off my door. Quoth the raven, nevermore. And the raven, never flitting, still is sitting, still is sitting, on the pallid bust of palace just above my chamber door. And his eyes have all the semen of a demon's that is dreaming. And the lamplight over him streaming throws his shadow on the floor. And my soul from out that shadow that lies floating on the floor shall be lifted nevermore. <clears throat> that, when you get it right, the poem can be a lot of fun to read. Um, as you can tell, I kind of screwed it up towards the end. <laughs> Um, but you kind of get what kind of feeling that he was, um, coming towards, you know, just like being, you know, it's like, um, you know, when you're living in your mind and you want to do something else, you know, you, you want to like break out of it, but you can't for some reason you can't and, um, you kind of get mad. You know, first at yourself, then, I mean, first at the world, then then at yourself. Um, so, I mean, th I mean, this poem has a lot of lessons for a lot of people. And, um, you know, of course, it's very fitting with um, Halloween. And um, Halloween, uh, way back when, was um, actually all about All Souls Day. And the Day of the Dead. And that was when you could um, honor those that have um, passed. Um, honor them in your way. And sometimes, um, as part of the myth goes, that if that soul that is trying to cross over can't for some reason... Whether that they can't let go of something or um, the um, living person is still still connected and can't let go in that way, can't move on with their life, um, the, uh, the door is open and 
you can talk with those that passed on and come up with healing. You know, not to scare, even though, you know, there was probably, um, you know, some spirits that, you know, try to take advantage of it. You know, just like people try and take advantage of stuff during the world. But basically, um, you know, the holiday is all about healing. You know, healing from the past. And, I mean, it's also nice that it comes, like, right in the middle of um, autumn, which is a season of change. You know, and using change is a season of transition, going from the old to the new. And a lot of people can't. So, um, you know, that's that's like the lessons for this Halloween this next poem is also from that website, the public domain website at pddlc.com. And it's a Robert Frost poem. And when I found out the truth of this poem, I was kind of shocked because I really didn't see it in the poem. You know, because I had bought a um, a book a while back, The uh, Idiot's Guide to Writing Poetry, and it's a good reference book, and it has like all the many forms of poetry. So if you wanted to kind of play around with other forms of poetry, uh, this book is a good book for that, and it gives you a lot of examples of that. And one of the types of poems is the death poem. And that's what, after apple picking, it was in that. It was a death poem. But... When I read it, my original interpretation was more like a work poem. You know, that, you know, he's, he's, um, he's done his work and now he's ready to go do something else. And I guess, in a way, that could be like death, you know, death and rebirth. Um, I don't know. Maybe I think, <laughs> maybe I was thinking my work at the time was like death. <laughs> How many feelings have we had of that? Um, you know, um, I mean, you know, when a job gets that bad, you know, it's it's time to look for something else. <laughs> um, because um, your job should be, um, you know, you should like it. You know, you, you know, it's your work. And um, if you don't like what you do, you should do something else. <laughs> and there's definitely a lot of other things to do. And uh, I do like what I'm doing now, but what I'm going to do, I like better. <laughs> you know, um, I love driving, and I think I'll always, like, uh, at some point be driving. But um, I'm, at least I'm hoping to, um, I'm, I've already been accepted to the school. I just got to work out the financial aid part of uh, going to film school, making movies, and taking what I do here to the next step because this is just so much fun anyways um, here is Af After Apple Picking by Robert Frost and uh, he's also the um, um, the New Hampshire poet the Yankee poet even though he was born in California in uh, San Francisco, when he moved to New Hampshire with his father and family um, way back, way back when, um, he grew to like it and became a Yankee. And uh, even though he went to England, he thought of New England as home, you know, because he's really, you know, he became he became a Yankee. When he came back, that's when he uh, got uh, got a home up in Franconia. And, oh, I've been to the Robert Frost place up in Lanconia. I mean, it's a small, small um, house. And they still do their best to uh, keep it up. Uh, but the scenery, it is just, oh, it's, it's, oh, I mean, no wonder why he uh, wrote a lot of his poems there. Hey, everybody, I am back. Yes, as you uh, heard, 
um, the phone ringing there, so I had to pause it. Um, I do love uh, this program that I use, uh, Magics, the Podcast Maker E version. Um, oh, man, it's just so much better than um, Cast Blaster. You can actually see the waveforms and uh, just have a better control of the thing. Um, of course, you only have um, two uh, oh two tracks that you can play around with, um, but you know it's still good because when I mean, you can record stuff with some background and you know um, it's still an awesome program and it does some um, uh, compression on the fly, so it's kind of cool. Um, so yeah, I mean that that area that Robert Frost. Um, was living. Um, it's it, it is such a beautiful area, and if you ever have a chance to come up here to New Hampshire, you've got to check out the Robert Frost place up in Franconia, New Hampshire. And um, actually, the um, uh, the best time would be during the summertime, because that's when they uh, open it up, and you can actually take a tour through the place. And they even have like uh, a film. A, a little film in the garage where um, that talks about Robert Frost, and you can also buy some Robert Frost stuff. You can go there during the winter time, but the house will be closed. But you can still go uh, walk around the property, uh, take a walk on the poetry trail. Um, it won't be maintained because, of course, there's no one there. Anyways, um, uh, New Hampshire is just a beautiful place. It's very inspirational. It's you know we have a lot of artists up here. We have a lot of writers. Um, of course, James Patrick Kelly is up here. Um, we have a lot of poets up here. Uh, a lot of craftspeople up here. Um, we have something that's the League of New Hampshire Craftsmen, and um, all that is. Um, and if you ever have a chance to go to a, a league um, event. Definitely go, you know, because you definitely see a lot of cool crafts, wood crafts, um, uh, yarn crafts, you know, cloth crafts, um, glass blowing. You name, you name the craft, and it would be there. Um, they even have like a painting thing. Even though I was just informed that they don't consider uh, painting as a craft, they think it as an art, but it's like. What the heck is the difference? <laughs> you know, it, <laughs> you're still using the same things to create. Anyways, um, just going to read the poem. Um, After Apple Picking by Robert Frost. And um, this is a death poem, but it could also be a poem about work. And, um, you know, have you had that experience when you've um, read a poem? And you took the meaning to be a certain way, but when somebody told you that it was actually another type of poem, you know, and then when they told you and you look back and you could, you know, you could see where it could be. Anyways, um, here is the poem. And uh, you can leave a comment in the comment section, wtwsonline.com. Um, anyways, After Apple Picking by Robert Frost. My long two-pointed ladder sticking through a tree toward heaven still. And there's a barrel that I didn't fill beside it. And there may be two or three apples I didn't pick upon some bough. But I am done with apple picking now. Essence of winter sleep is on the night. The scent of apples I'm drowsing off. I cannot shake the shimmer from my sight I got from looking through a pane of glass I skimmed this morning from the water trough and held it against a world of hoary grass. It melted, and I let it fall and break. But I was well upon my way to sleep before it fell, and I could tell what form my dreaming was about to take. Magnified apples appear and reappear, stem end and blossom end, and every fleck of russet showing clear. My instep arch not only keeps the ache, it keeps the pressure of a ladder round. And I keep hearing from the cellar bin that rumbling sound 
of load on load of apples coming in. For I have had too much of apple picking. I am overtired of the great harvest I myself desired. There were ten thousand thousand fruit to touch, cherish in hand, lift down and not let fall. For all that struck the earth, no matter if not bruised or spiked with stubble, went surely to the cider apple heap as of no worth. One can see what will trouble the sleep of mine, whatever sleep it is. Were he not gone, the woodchuck could say whether it's like his long sleep, as I described its coming on, or just some human sleep. Now, that probably there, you know, that reference there could probably bring it to the death poem status when he starts talking about sleep because death is, you know, it's like a sleep, you know. Um, but see, that's physical death. But there's another type of death out there, a metaphorical death. You know, that's um, a death of, like, when something major in your life has just ended and something other major, another major thing is starting to to begin, that is like a death and rebirth. With a transition in the middle, uh, going from one to the other, you know, whether it be from one job to the other, or what have you. So, you know, I suppose it could talk about the physical death, but this poem could also be about the mythological death, you know, of, um, you know, spending your whole year working and you're ready now to like sit back, relax, maybe write some poems, um, observe nature. You know, they didn't have TVs back then, so they had to look at something, right? I'm glad we have TVs now because I do get a lot of my inspiration from uh, various television shows. Um, inspiration's everywhere. You know, and the common metaphors in life, it's always there. No matter what new thing comes up next, you know, you still have that metaphor. And that's interesting. Um, next poem. You know, I read this thing a couple times. And, uh, um, I don't know what to make of it. Um, I think it's supposed to be like a fun poem. It's definitely a poem about death. You know, the title, um, Twas Just This Time Last Year I Died, um, has, uh, death in it. But, you know, as I was like reading this, this poem, you know, I mean, it could be a major serious poem. It could be a fun poem. Um, you know, a serious poem about somebody who had died, you know, and is maybe a spirit now. Or it could be about the clouds, or a tree, or a leaf that's up high. Because, I mean, after all, leaves do die in the fall. You know, and they, they're they reborn. Um, so, you know, I don't know what she actually meant from this poem, but it's probably... 
you know, it's probably the tree or the uh, the sky. But you know, it would be interesting if she meant uh, spirit. You know, like I said, you know, there are many, many ways to interpret a poem, and you interpret the poem yourself. And how do you interpret the poem? Well, it depends on what's going on in your life at the time. You see in the poem what you want to see or what your subconscious or your soul wants you to see. And it brings it up to the forefront. You know, it's like a tool, uh, a tool of learning, a tool of learning about yourself, whether you read poems or write poems. Um, and that's, when I write a poem, that is when I'm, um, that's what I write to, you know, write from soul to soul. And um, I suppose that's what I do when I read the poem. And um, you can get a whole load of enlightenment when you read poems like that, you know, uh, seeing what the poem means to you and why it means to you. And if there's like any healing there or anything that, you know, your soul um, or your subconscious um, is trying to tell you. So here is the poem. Twas, let me read that title again. <laughs> Twas just this time last year I died. And that's, of course, by Emily Dickinson. And they do have a uh, birth and death. Um, she was born December 10th and died, I mean, December 10th, 1830, and died May 15th, 1886. So, yeah, she only lived like maybe uh, right around 55, 56 years old. They didn't live that long back then, you know. Anyways, here's a poem. "'Twas just this time last year I died. I know I heard the corn when I was carried by the farms and had the tassels on. I thought how yellow it would look when Richard went to the mill. And then I wanted to get out, but something held my will. I thought just how red apples wedged the stubble's joints between and carts when strooping round the fields to take the pumpkins in. I wondered which would miss me least, and when Thanksgiving came, if Father'd multiplied the plates to make an even sum, and if my stocking hung too high, would it blur the Christmas glee that not a Santa Claus could reach the altitude of me? But this sort of grieved myself, and so I thought how it would be when just this time, some perfect year, themselves should come to me. And, um, you know, it's, uh, it's an interesting poem. And the thing, the lines, they stick out to me. Um, would it blur the Christmas glee that not a Santa Claus could reach the altitude of me? That makes me think, you know, there's something higher there. And what's higher? You know, spirit, leaves, clouds. Well, I suppose Santa Claus could reach clouds. Um, he probably could reach leaves too, but... Could Santa Claus reach spirit or soul? Interesting. Maybe that's why um, you know people back then thought of death a little bit more because they lived such short lives. Well, compared to us, even though they probably didn't think they were short, <laughs> um, just like we think that our lives are not short now. Living up to what eighty, ninety, even though I, I intend on living to one hundred and sixty, if not <laughs> further. Hey, medical science, you know the uh, the um, advances they're making. Who knows? <laughs> Who knows what 
2012 will bring. That seems to be the number, right? You know, the number of um, our current death cycle. Because that's what 2012 is like. You know, people think everything's like ending 20, you know, that day, 2012, December 21st, uh, 2012. You know, wouldn't it be something if what it passed, like the millennium passed, you know? Maybe we get too much into our imaginations, our minds, you know? And then again, maybe that's the whole point of life. Um, here's another poem by Edgar Allan Poe. And uh, it's entitled Alone, and it's a short poem. Alone by Edgar Allan Poe. From childhood's hour I have not been, as others were, I have not seen, as others saw and cannot bring my passions from a common spring. From the same source I have not taken, my sorrow I could not awaken, my heart to joy at the same tone, and all I loved, I loved alone. Then, in my childhood, in the dawn, of a most stormy life was drawn, from every depth of good and ill, the mystery which binds me still, from the torrent or the fountain, from the red cliff of the mountain, from the sun that round me rolled in its autumn tint of gold, from the lightning in the sky as it passed me flying by, from the thunder and the storm and the clouds that took the form when the rest of heaven was blue, of a demon, in my view. Now, you know, I have no idea what to make of that poem. I would probably have to read that poem over uh, a few more times. And um, and sometimes that's what we gotta do. We gotta we gotta do we gotta um, read something over a few more times and meditate. That seems to be a word that people don't like. They like prayer. Oh, yes, we should pray. We should pray. But think of this. Prayer is a talking. Okay, you're talking. You're taking up space um, to God or that thing that is higher than yourself. But if you're always talking... When are you listening? You don't think that the God or the higher lives or the higher selves has something to say to you? That is when we meditate. And a very simple meditation is to get quiet, control your breathing, and just sit. And... Whatever pops into your mind, the first thing, is probably something that's really troubling you. Just focus on that one thing and try and come up with a solution or what that problem or that thing is trying to tell you. And um, you're honest with yourself and you do the exercise. You can find out that um you know you you could find out something that you know you need that is uh that'd be like a godsend it's like oh wow why haven't i thought of this before you'll have one of those feelings you know an epiphany epiphany don't you just love the sound of that word epiphany oh epiphany epiphany my epiphany <laughs> I love this mic. It's so sensuous. <laughs> Getting silly here. 
don't know, maybe that's what this poem's about, a silliness. Hmm. Maybe he just feels um, alone in life. Maybe he wrote this poem after he wrote The Raven. You know, because he was um, sad that he lost his love. Or maybe he wrote it before The Raven. Or maybe he had another loss that he wrote this poem from. Or, I don't know, maybe he was just observing someone who had a major loss. I don't know. Maybe he just felt alone in the universe. You know, a lot of us can't feel like that. We stay in our homes or our apartments or just doing the usual things in our lives and not going out. You know, we just have this little routine that we do. You know, we go, we wake up, brush our teeth, eat. Go get some coffee, drive to work, listen to an MP3 player, work our work, come home, listening to our MP3 player, sit down in front of the TV or behind a book, either watch TV or read the book, and that's it. And that's all they do. You know, that's a, kind of like an alone feeling. Instead of like getting out there and doing stuff and trying stuff. Some people are so afraid to try new things. But uh, you know, when you try new things, um, there's a certain excitement, a certain energy that's there. And it's like, yes! Oh, I feel good! I feel good! <laughs> I would... Okay, I won't sing. So anyways, uh, what's the next poem here? Um, oh, we're almost done. Uh, which is good because it's like 42 minutes. <laughs> you know, like when I originally did this show, before I chose to do it like a poetry reading, um, the show was only like 25 minutes and I was just listening to poems. That's it. <laughs> that's all you You go, you listen to poems and that's it. Now you actually listen to poems, you listen to me talk about the poems, you know. Is it better? <laughs> Let me know. You know, email me at bob at wtwsonline.com or leave a comment in the comment section. Or better yet, give me a call. The comment line is 603-513-2411. Again, that's 603-513-2411. Um, this next poem, it's only one page, um, there is a, uh, science fiction show, it's an older science fiction show, I forget when it was on, but it was like somewhere in the new millennium it was on, um, I don't know, it's probably 2002, maybe 2003, I'm not sure, I think it lasted a couple seasons, I wish it lasted more, because the show had so much potential. As with many shows out there that have potential, uh, the people who actually make the decision to keep that thing on the air or not and let it go out, sometimes they make, they really F up, <laughs> you know, and they pull it before it has a chance to, you know, get into it because they could have went so many different ways with this show. And the show is entitled Dead Like Me, and that's also the title of the poem. And, um, you know, um, imagine, you know, you're a teenager, just starting to go into high school. I think it was high school. Or maybe, I don't know, maybe she was um, had graduated high school and she chose not to go to college. Um, but, I mean, she was like, you know, like most teenagers, you know, they're... Um, they go within themselves. Um, and, you know, she did that um, and until one day um, she died. You know, and died, I don't know, maybe a, 
not exactly a dignified way. You know, there was a uh, toilet seat from space, you know, from uh, some space station. I don't know, maybe somebody flushed too hard. <laughs> oh, that's, that's terrible. Uh, maybe, uh, I don't know, maybe there was too much fiber in their diet that their toilet couldn't handle it. Oh, man, that's terrible. That's terrible. And they flushed and broke the toilet, or, I don't know. But maybe they had to. <laughs> but they flushed, instead of flushing the waste, they <laughs> injected the toilet. Oh, man, this is, this is getting bad. <laughs> um, but this show, <laughs> There was a sense of comedy in this show as well. Um, but there was also some serious stuff going on. You know, some uh, wisdom there that she was passing out. She was gaining and she was also passing out. You know, just, you know, yes, I'm dead and this is how it is being dead. You know, because um, being dead, what else can you do but observe the living? <laughs> you know? Um, then there can be a little loneliness in there too. Anyways, this poem is about that. Dead like me. To be among the living at one moment, and the next to be among the dead at such a young age where life's in the beginning of adventure of lessons and the ecstasy of the life force. But then, among the dead, side by side with the living, unable to cross over, living a new life, bound to the earth until lessons of life and death are learned and a new wisdom gained. To have a toilet seat from space, determine your fate, in the prime of life, and a choice not made by you. All of life's possibilities cut short by the one act. All your dreams fade in the dust of the earth. Looking to understand Life and death in your bardo. Becoming a reaper and experiencing life in a new way. And death, she found new life. Seeing life on the flip side brings a new understanding. Two roads converse in an experience where life and death meet in the yin and the yang. To understand the science of creation. <laughs> she learns her life lessons in the form of death. Seeing both sides of the coin. And discovers her true destiny. And ascends as the ancients of old. Um... It's another poem you could have fun with. You could read this like any number of ways. Um, Dead Like Me, you know, if you didn't know about the show, it could have a whole other different type of meaning to you. Um, or if you see like maybe multiple meanings of the poem, just by how you read the poem, um, a meaning, a new meaning comes out. And if you read a poem in a different way, a new meaning comes out. Um, and this one term that a lot of people probably wouldn't be familiar with um, that I used in here, and that's bardo. And uh, bardo is, um, um, I think it's like a Chinese term, Chinese-Japanese term. Um, I've heard it talked about in... Um, I used to watch the Kung Fu series, and Kung Fu The Legend Continues, which oh, I think is so much better than the original series. Um, and one of the um, shows, um, his son was in a bardo. And 
they explain Bardo as kind of like in between birth and death, where you can't cross over, that your soul is um, tormented, and it brings up these images in an unconscious state, and you're kind of stuck in these images, and it plays these images over and over and over again, until you can find your way out of your bardo, learn the lesson that you need to learn, and find your way out. It's kind of like what the bardo is. And it's kind of like how it was for her. Um, so, and, um, of course, you know, that is like so Halloween and so death again. You know, and death, you know, it's actually... Both here, you know, the, the physical death, but there's also a uh, metaphorical death. Um, there's a um, dying to like an old way of being, an old way of seeing, you know, um, like you knew how things are supposed to be, but then something happens and a rug kind of... Um, gets pulled from under you. You are like spinning there and the weightless of space and you don't know where to land next. And um, then there comes this new thing and a new truth and as as you come to assimilate that new truth and trying to come to an understanding of it, that's how we learn new truths. They come to us whether we like it or not. Um, and when we're ready to learn a new truth, we learn it. You know, whether we have to be forced to learn it or not. Um, and we go through this process of trying to understand it. And as we go through this process, we incorporate that new truth um, into our belief system. And that takes us to a new place. Um, that's how we learn. And that's the purpose of life here on earth. To learn. To learn about creation. To learn about life. Um, <clears throat> the last poem is uh, one that I wrote. I wrote it last year. Um, actually, I wrote Dead Like Me last year, too. I think it was last year. I'm pretty sure it was last year. I know I definitely wrote um, Halloween last year. You know, because I wanted to... You know, people write stories about Christmas a lot, or songs about Christmas. But they kind of leave out the other holidays. And, uh, you know, people kind of like... You know, where's the Halloween songs? <laughs> you know, we definitely have Halloween movies, you know, and uh, it's usually where, uh, you know, all the movies about hauntings and ghosts and goblins are, <laughs> I'll get you my little pretty and your little dog too. <laughs> he says this as can be, you'll never catch me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> After that moment of insanity. I definitely make these things interesting, don't I? Um, There's really been, you know, not much songs or poems written about Halloween. Um, Of course, we've adopted a few. And actually, I was going to try and do a reading of um, the... I can't remember the name of the story, but, you know, it's about Ichabod Crane, the Headless Horseman. I was going to do that, but it's a long story. (laughs) It would take a bit reading it. Um, So I figured, you know, I'll do a poem. And I'll do a poem about what Halloween means to me. You know, um, and Halloween means to me, it's, um, you know, a day of, transition it's a day of looking at your past honoring your past 
being thankful for where you've been. And if there's anything that needs healing, to work on that healing. And after you work on that healing and are healed from it and honored your past, you know, you can go on to a future thing. And see, usually, whenever I try and do anything new, I try and start it in the autumn. Because the autumn is like, uh, for me, it's always been like a symbol of change. Because there's a lot of change that's going on in autumn. So usually when I start things, it's usually around the autumn. I mean, I do start things other times of the year. But, you know, major stuff, major decisions, major things. It's usually the autumn. It's also much cooler. (laughs) I don't sweat as much in the autumn. I sweat too much during the summertime. I like the temperatures of autumn. I just like everything about autumn. It's awesome. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Awesome, awesome. (laughs) Oh, I'm approaching an hour, and I'm probably going to go over an hour. But I hope this podcast has been entertaining. (laughs) I hope you enjoyed it. You know, and I hope you're still there. (laughs) Laughing with me and thinking and just, you know, celebrating life. C'est la vie. That's French for that's life, or it is life, or this is life. Se means a lot of things in French. <laughs> Anyways, here is Halloween. Halloween. A holy day forgotten in myths past and folklore. The day where cycles complete and begin again. The day where the beginning meets the end and the end meets the beginning. Cool autumn night, magic in the air, marvel at the unseen wonders, the unknown mystery, the future, the future that begins today, continues. All hollows eve, All Souls' Eve, the Day of the Dead, where the beginning meets the end, and the end meets the beginning. Life's magic is in the air. The mystery is around. The wind whispers its secrets of the future's time, of that place, of that beingness, of that unknown. Of that great unknown, the wind whispers its secrets and the magic that's round. One day, one night a year, we come to know life's continuity. Where the living and the dead meet and talk of the mystery, the great mystery, the great unknown, metaphor of the night sky the backdrop of darkness, the starlight within, tells us its secrets. Metaphors of life and death, light and darkness. We are as the stars to the darkness of matter, but also the beauty there, the cool wind through your hair, the light that shines. Where you're not lonely, the connection between life and death becomes the day where life and death meet. The question is asked, who is sleeping? Who is awake? The mystery becomes. We float on, perception sees, to wonder of the great mystery the great purpose, the great protections and perceptions sees, understanding the great mystery, a part of life, life. On All Hallows Eve, the day of the dead, the day of the living meet, completing a cycle 
a cycle offering healing and remembrance. Okay, <clears throat> it's one poem I get into. You know, there's uh, many poems I get into, and that's one of them. Um, oh, I just love this so much. You know, and uh, it's not quite an hour yet, but it's fast approaching it. I just wanted to. Um, take in and celebrate what's been going on in my life, you know. I've had a lot change in the past three months, you know. To go from one form of employment to another, you know, I'm pretty much still doing the same thing. Delivering, driving. But instead of working for the company, I contract with the company through another company. Yes, I'm now considered an independent contractor and is self-employed. You know, and the first month was kind of like tough. You know, it's like, uh, oh. Am I going to make this? You know, I, I had my doubts. You know, it's like, because it's like so different. You know, got to use your own vehicle. Um, pay for your own tolls. Um, keep track of stuff that normally you don't keep track of. And it's like, am I going to make this? You know, and there's that doubt there and that. Doubt is usually there whenever we transition from one to, from something else to, you know, another thing. And, um, if we keep doing it, you know, I mean, I had no choice. Um, I mean, I suppose I could, could have, like, went to get another job and punched the clock. But I would not have gotten paid as much as I get paid now. True, I gotta pay my own expenses, including health care. And uh one thing, do not vote for Hillary. You know, national health care is stupid. Um the national government should not be control of health care. And you know, true there's a problem with big business and health care. I think there's a middle way to that. Like, oh, maybe the uh, um, credit unions. But credit union for, like, healthcare. Anyways, it's another podcast. You know, paying all this stuff myself. And then you reached a point, and it's like, you know, this is awesome. (laughs) You know, I love my root. You know, um, I work actually less hours than I used to work. You know, I used to work 60, 80 hours. It's like very exhausting. It's like I had no life. You know, punching a clock and working those crazy hours. Now, you know, between 30 and 35 hours I work. I have the whole afternoon to myself. I usually sleep in the morning. You know, uh, sometimes when I get home. Late, um, I watch uh, Food Network. I love Good Eats. Ah, awesome show. Um, he's just so entertaining. And uh, I love it. And uh, it's like, it's so freeing not punching a clock. You don't know how it feels to not punch a clock until you actually do it. You know, it's like, ah, oh, ah, oh, man, it's awesome. And no matter what I do... You know, I'm, uh, you know, kind of keep it in the uh, independent contractor range. And uh, 
I love these podcasts so much, and I started doing video cast. I haven't produced any new video in quite some time, even though I've been taking video clips. I just haven't put in, putting them all together. And uh, I love it. I love producing. I love like creating these like little mini stories. And uh, I want to continue doing that. And I love movies. I love story. I love putting things together to make a story. And uh, to say something. And uh, that's when I kind of decided to uh, to do filmmaking, digital filmmaking. Um. I just kind of made that, you know, I was thinking about it. I made that choice and say, this is what I'm going to (laughs) do. I looked up on the net, and there were like only two places. They're both in in Massachusetts. You know, so so the commute commute is like, uh, well, hour and a half, because mass mass traffic, especially rush hour, it can be a bit, you know, because the school's like an hour away from me. But going through mass traffic, it's um, close to an hour and a half, maybe a little bit more. If there was an accident, it probably would be more. Um, this is so much cars down there <laughs> on the roads. Anyways, um, I just made that choice and uh, been accepted to the school and... Uh, just got to worry about financial aid. Um, so, I already made one transition. Now I'm working to make another one. <laughs> and plus, I'm also working on some uh, some projects for this uh, podcast. Um, and uh, some big projects that actually takes steps to take. You know, like step one, step two, step three, step four. Uh, Because there's a lot to it. It's simple, but there's a lot to it. But it's fun. And that's what your work has to be. Your work has to be fun. If it's not fun, like uh, uh, a manager, uh, one of the managers I used to work for um, in a department store, he was saying, um, you know, if your job's no longer fun, then you should be doing something else. Because your job has to be fun. Because you're going to be doing it for, you know, a good part of your life. And if it's not fun, why are you doing it? <laughs> you know? <sighs> Take that choice. That leap, that job. Find what you want to do, what you really want to do. And just kind of map out. Don't make any major um, changes, just kind of map it out. You know, like if you were to do this, what w- what would you do? You know, what well, would step one be? Step two, step three, step four. You know, come up with a plan on how you would do it. And think, is it worth it? And then make the decision yourself. Now, Plans don't always come out the way you want, <laughs> but they do come out. You do get to the end, and it is fast approaching an hour and eight minutes, and I'm going to wrap up this podcast, and uh, just thankful for you know the past year, the past three months, and the future, the future couple months, and uh, you know beginning of next year, January. That's when I should be starting my school. My hours, 8.30 to 4.30. Um, meeting new people, doing new stuff. Just thankful for it all. My family, my friends, my podcast, and all you listeners out there. I thank you so much for continuing to listen to me. And I like to hear comments. I love to hear comments from you. So use one of the ways. Either my website, make a comment there, wtwsonline.com. Email me, bob at wtwsonline.com. Or my favorite, call the comment line, 603-513-2411. Again, 603-513-2411. And as always, stay creative in the magics of life. 
and death. Thank you for listening. This podcast is a member of the Association of Poetry Podcasting at poetrypodcasting.org.